the Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that I have really, really looked forward to speaking to. He is one of my favorite guests on the Tom Wood Show. And that is saying a lot. He just had an amazing interview with my good buddy, Raul Paul. So we've got him here today. Dominic Frisbee, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. For my viewers who might not know your full backstory, can you get us up to speed on what you do? Yeah, well, it's it's odd, George. It's unusual. And uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, it's a, it's a consequence of being a freelancer. Do you call them freelancers in the States or do yeah, you call them? Yeah. A, it's a consequence of being a freelancer. And uh, I think sort of life takes you not always where you plan to go. But I actually started out when I was at school, I wanted to be a writer. Mm. And, and I looked at all the uh, best writers and, you know, Charles Dickens and William Shakespeare and so on. And they'd all started out as actors, so I figured I'm going to go and I'm going to go to drama. I'm going to go to drama school and become an actor in order to be a writer. And then when I was at drama school, for some reason, I was the best in the whole school at radio. <laughs> mm. Maybe I've got a good face for radio or something like that. So uh, <laughs> I ended up. <laughs> so I ended up uh, getting a voiceover agent, and then I spent like five or ten years doing voiceovers. Right. And uh, it's quite a good job. It's you're very well treated, and and. Um, and I did a little bit of acting, but it was always voiceovers had been good for me. And then I'd made a bit of money. And then I wrote this song that I was quite pleased with. And I, and this was back in the 90s. And I gave it to a friend of mine. And I said, look, um, can we do a Christmas novelty single for this comic, comic song? And he said, no, go and do it at my brother's club. So I went and did it, did it at his brother's club. And I didn't realize it. But his brother's club was like the most notorious place where comedians go to die. And everyone mm. who was on the bill that night died except me and they booked me again so sudden and then they gave me loads of other bookings so suddenly I was a stand-up comic and so I was a sort of stand-up comic and a, and a voiceover with the original thing of being a writer and then this we're in the mid-noughties now um, I had a bit of money and I wanted to invest it and I started you know reading stuff on the internet and I discovered the commodities boom and gold specifically Mm. And I started reading about gold and gold is, of course, very political metal. And I started reading about money creation and suddenly I understood why house prices are so ridiculously expensive, which is something I'd never been able to understand before. And I was like, I'm really interested in this. And there were all these really clever people, um, James Turk and Jim Rogers mm. and various others. And uh, I, I really want to talk to these guys. So I started a podcast <laughs> mm. as a means to talk to them so I could talk to them without having to pay an hourly you know, consultancy fee or something like that. Right. And the podcast is very popular and I met all sorts of people. And then one of the people I met, excuse me, I've got terrible cold, so I'll keep playing with my nose. And one of the people I met was a lady called Marin Somerset Webb, who's the editor of Money Week, which mm. is the UK's most popular um, financial publication, weekly financial publication. And she said, oh, we need people like you to come and write for us. And I said, well, I don't really know what I'm talking about. She said, no, 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 it's fine. You, you'll be fine. And so I started writing a weekly investment column about gold and commodities for Money Week, and it was very popular. And and then so suddenly I was like a gold and commodities guru while being a stand up comedian. Mm. <laughs> and and that and then the writing went very well. And I wrote three books and I wrote a film called Four Horsemen, which is very popular, co-wrote that and I narrated that as well. And it's just sort of morphed. I've just got this double life. Like sometimes I'm writing stand up comedy songs and other times I'm writing books about finance and money. And I think I'm about the only, I'm certainly the world's only financial comedian and, and writer. And at one point I was about the UK's only sort of libertarian minded comedian. But, but recently with the goings on of the last few years, a lot of comedians have sort of slowly been coming out of the closet and re realizing their deluded left wing ways and taking a more libertarian capitalist approach to life, which is good to see. Well, that's interesting. Well, it's good to hear because they're going the complete opposite direction in the United States. So th that's good that there's some sanity on the other side of the, the pond when it comes well, to there's the... lots of lunacy as well. Yeah. So how did you kind of, move into or what brought you to uh the libertarian mindset and the austrian school of economics gold yeah okay and if golden and and i i have to say it was a bull market 
you know, if, if, it, if I'd been reading about gold in 1993 and it had been falling every, you know, by 15 or 20 percent every year for the next five or 10 years, I probably wouldn't have been quite so keen on it. But it helped the fact that gold was appreciating, you know, 15, 20 percent every year as it was back in the noughties. So that was your gateway drug yeah. to libertarianism and then kind of Austrian economics. And you uh, kind of opens up your eyes. And you're like, OK, I, this is the way I think the world works or should work. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm very interested in the relationship between gold and natural law. Uh, na you know, natural law is a distinguished from physical law. Natural law is is not man-made law, but things that occur naturally. And one of the things that always interested me about gold, because a lot of people say we can never go back to a gold standard because there isn't enough gold to go round. Right. And I'm saying, well, we could. You'd have to revalue gold upwards a lot. But it interests me that and and this is a common complaint about Bitcoin is about gold. They say, well, the the uh, inflation rate of gold isn't transparent. You know, you can just if the price goes up, you can just increase mining. Well, actually, it's not that easy because <laughs> you just need to look at the competence of gold mining companies to know that a it's not that easy and b you know gold mining is a difficult business. Gold is very hard to extract, mm -hmm. but the fact that gold um, supply and population growth are exactly the same and that's right. always interested me gold and supply has increased at exactly the same rate as the population has grown and that to me makes it a very natural form of money yeah there's a reason it's been money for five thousand years i'll say you know something can be money for maybe five years and get away with it or maybe even 50 years but if it's that way for five thousand years there's got to be some reason why but uh, let's move you know, on. Go ahead. Gold yeah. was the very first, George. Um, I've been studying this. Gold was the very first metal that man used. He was using gold long before, thousands of years before he used copper or, or, or tin or any of the other native metals. Um, mm -hmm. Because in those days, you would find nuggets of gold in riverbeds and, and so on. Right. And and, you know, what did he use them for to decorate himself, but also as reward. You know, for brave deeds or or some good service done to the community or whatever it was, people would, you know, give each other these bits of gold. So, you know, he was using it as money reward even before he was using copper. Mm -hmm. I didn't and, you know, because it was long before that it was it was it was thousands of years before men man discovered smelting. And that's when he first started using copper. So long before the Bronze Age. And I think and and there's something about gold and it's its beauty. And it would have seen it glistening in riverbeds and it would have captivated Stone Age man. There's a fantastic picture of Putin. You see him staring at a gold bar today and he looks utterly transfixed by it. Well, it would have been the same compelling nature of it, you know, to our Stone Age ancestors. Yeah. You know, one of the ways that people look at gold and they look at uh, Bitcoin is kind of a, a network system. So Bitcoin is this network and you see it competing with the dollar network system. And a lot of people see Bitcoin overtaking the dollar. Again, a network. But when you go back to gold, um, what, what differentiates in my mind gold from Bitcoin as far as when it started is when gold started to become money, there were no other networks of money that, it, that were in place that it needed to defeat. Mm -hmm. You see, because it was so, there was so deep, I'm sure people might have been using beans or cows or, or rice or something as a store of value, but there was really no centrally uh, or global network. It was all so decentralized that gold came in and it was the first kind of, I don't want to call it centralized, but universally accepted form of money where now Bitcoin, and I'm not saying Bitcoin isn't going to uh, overtake the dollar. I, that's not what this is about. But Bitcoin does have an additional hurdle uh, to becoming global sound money that gold uh, just didn't have. Am I understanding history and how it transpired correctly or am I not seeing it right? Well, I would the 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 one of the very first systems of money or debt based money. Now, Bitcoin is 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 basically a digital bearer 
instrument. It's not a debt-based money. It's it's right, like gold. Right. It's a bearer instrument. And by the way, I'm a bit big. I like Bitcoin a lot, um, but I'm one of these rare people that likes Bitcoin and likes gold. Yeah, so am I. It's, I like both it seems too. one I like of these divided reasons, things. Though. Yeah, yeah. And like I wrote the first book about Bitcoin back in 2014. So you know, uh, it's not. I like Bitcoin, and I know what I'm talking about. One of the very first systems of money that was used in ancient Mesopotamia when human beings had already settled was they would make tokens. So um, uh, uh, like a cone would be a, a measure of barley and a disc would be a sheep and two discs would be two sheep and so on. And then they would bake these tokens inside clay balls. And that was a record of a debt. And then they would smash open the clay ball and the debt was settled. Now that clay ball was effectively like a mini blockchain, if you, if you see what I mean. And, the, you know, with little tokenized forms of money in it. Little, little, not digital tokens, but mud tokens. And then they realized that it was actually quicker and more efficient instead of baking this in clay balls to just inscribe the clay with um, pictures instead. And thus did we develop the first hieroglyphs, the first system of handwriting based around the first system of money. And the most common debt that was owed was was um, tax, taxes, tithes right. and so on. Right. Right. And so and that was a system of record keeping, essentially. So even though it was a debt based record keeping system that that had there's more parallels there with the blockchain than they are with with gold. Um, I, I view the world. There's, it's almost like there's two economies now. There's the digital economy, which exists, and then there's the physical economy. So in the physical economy, you have mining and farming and industry and all this kind of thing. And then in the digital economy, you have, you know, trademarks and apps and Google and, and shares in software companies and Bitcoin and these kind of things and NFTs. And they're almost like two separate economies. And the growth rate of the digital economy is like just eclipses the potential growth rate of the um, physical economy. And you just need to look at how, you know, if you compare Silicon Valley to now, to what it was in 1990 or something, you just see the incredible growth. And investors like the growth you get from digital because, you know, you get a much quicker, you know, it takes 10 years to build a gold mine. You can get a return on your investment in a, in a digital company in, in a year or something. So there's, and, and there's much more scalability. So, but, you know, I, I, I accept the argument that Bitcoin is gold for the digital economy. Uh, and gold, on the other hand, is pretty much the most analog asset there is in the world. Mm. It is pure physical money that has pretty much no other use. So I just the, the distinction between Bitcoin and gold is the same distinction between um, digital and physical or analog and digital, if you like. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So tell us about this. I believe it's a, a recent book that you wrote on taxes and, and government and how that uh, interplays with war and maybe even Bitcoin and gold. Uh, I, that uh, that um, interview you had with Raul that I listened to was absolutely fascinating. And as soon as I listened to it, I text my assistant and said, you've got to get Dominic on my show to talk about this new book. So can you walk us through that? Do you know what, George? I was actually emailing you <laughs> about three months ago when I was because when the book came out in the States about three months ago, and I was emailing everyone who who I knew was sort of like ideologically pretty much on the same side as me one of whom was Raul and and I actually emailed you and said can I come on your podcast and I never got a reply <laughs> because you used the wrong email maybe I, I don't mean, give I, out I don't give out my personal email but when we get done with this <laughs> yeah I'll, okay I'll no give, that's fine I'll I'm give you my direct email I'm, I'm not having a I'm not having a go at you but I, I think I just went on I can't remember now but I think I went on George Gammon.com or I might even have messaged you on Twitter or something and it would have been one of probably a hundred you know, a thousand emails that you get every day. Yeah, because I, I would have loved to interview you back then. <laughs> and I should have done it before Raoul. I'll beat him yeah. to the punch next time. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, but the, yeah, so this is um, my book, Daylight. Now, my big theory in the world used to be that if we're going to save the world, we need to fix money. We need to get rid of fiat money and go back to 
uh, I call it independent money, whether it's gold or silver or Bitcoin or whatever it is. But okay. government, we need to stop. We need to take away. We, money needs to be apolitical. The state can't have the power to print, create money. And that's how we save the world. And then that, that thinking evolved into taxation. I started thinking, actually, we need to, um, you know, if we're going to fix the world, you, you, you design a society by the way you tax it. You design the incentives for that society. You design, you know, you determine how free that its people are going to be or how subordinated, how prosperous, how poor. And and then I started to look back through history and then I realized that every there's never been a civilization in history that didn't have taxes of some kind. And even the libertarian digital idyll that is Bitcoin has taxes in the form of miners fees. Taxation, as as your great leader, Benjamin Franklin, once said, like death is inevitable. And so this book, Daylight Robbery, is an attempt to make the argument to just make people aware. We, nobody talks about taxes except to moan about you know how much tax they have to pay. But nobody looks at the world through the prism of tax. Nobody thinks right. about it, realizes, right. you know, how important tax should be a subject that we teach at school like chemistry and maths. You know, that's how bigger part of our education it should, it should occupy and it you, you don't just design design a society and determine its destiny by the way you tax it but then you actually start looking back through history and you realize that that every great event in history bar none has got some kind of untold tax story uh, behind it without which the events would have turned out very differently and and so I'll give you a little challenge, George. We'll have a bit of fun. I just want you to sure. shout out uh, events from history, random events, and I'll attempt to tell you what the ta the untold tax story was behind that event. World War Two. OK, so every war, <laughs> every single war is made possible by taxes. If there were no taxes, you could not have war because there would be no means of paying for it. And those taxes either happen during the event or they take the form of debt. You know, debt is a, I regard debt as a tax on the future because it is going to be paid back by some form of taxation, whether it's actually paid back or whether that taxation takes the form of inflation. Um, but the, but every war is paid for by some kind of tax. And not only that, it's not just that tax makes war possible, it's that war makes tax possible. Every war involves the imposition of new taxes that would not have been viable in peacetime. It's only the crisis that, that gives people the possibility of, of taxes. Right. And so in America, you got your 1942 Revenue Act, which brought income tax to every man. Prior to 1942, income tax was only paid by the, the richest Americans. And there was a huge campaign. Don, there was a video of Donald Duck patriotically going to pay his tax uh, that was circulated. And there was a, Irving Berlin was commissioned to write a song which goes, I paid my income tax today. And if you listen to the lyric of that song, it goes, a thousand planes to bomb Berlin. They've got to be paid for. And I chip, chipped in. That certainly makes me feel OK. I paid my income tax today or something like that. And so was ever the link between war and tax more <laughs> starkly stated? And Americans were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to bomb Berlin. Let's let's pay our income tax. Now, the thing is, did they pitch it as temporary back then? Not not the income tax in total, but the income tax affecting the, the, the broad population. I don't know the answer to that, but I would say almost certainly yes. Right. Yeah. And um, because what always happens is that after the crisis has passed, the taxation, the control never goes back to the levels it was before the crisis started. Right. They right. stay. Mm -hmm. And you, you got it with your 19. And the very first income tax came to America, actually, in 1861, I'm going to say, or 1862, maybe Lincoln imposed it. For the Civil um, War. To, to, yeah, to pay for his war. And I, it was abandoned about 1875. It went away. Well, that's good to know that that income tax was actually abandoned. Uh, <laughs> maybe we, there's hope. OK, yeah. so when, when you say that the taxes shape society, are, are, I'm assuming you're talking about the differences between like a consumption tax 
uh, an income tax, a wealth tax, and how, you know, do you have more of one and less of the other or tariffs, something like that. Um, in your study, did you see a certain system that seemed to work better uh, consistently throughout not only uh, different time frames, but in different countries? Yeah, uh, well, the answer to all of those questions is yes. Um, the taxation is almost like a measure of freedom. Yeah, right. The degree to which you're taxed is, is you know, Margaret Thatcher used to say, you can't have freedom without economic freedom. Mm. And I like to look on it as how of a worker's, how much of his labor does a man own? Right. And, and in the States at the moment, I think it's what, 40%, something like that. Um, in, in, uh, 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 taxes as a proportion of GDP, excluding inflation are around about 45%, I think in the States, but, but, but what's the higher rate income tax in the States? Is it 40%? Currently it's almost 40%, but then you've got to add on, uh, state taxes. Okay. Which, which so, is like California can, it can really, really go up and that's just income tax. Okay. So the ordinary worker doesn't own that much of his own labor, even in, you know, the free country that is the United States is worse in Europe. We have higher taxes. Um, now, if you look at, um, you know, North Korea or some totalitarian state, the worker owns none of his labor. Right, right. It's all taken. It's all owned by the government. And in a slave with in a, if you have a slave, that slave owns he doesn't even own his own body, let alone his own labor. And then at the other. So that's one extreme. And, and we're and then at the other extreme, you have an anarchy where there's no taxes at all. And that's total freedom. And our sort of social democracies are sort of somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Mm -hmm. Now. If you look at the, the most successful, the most innovative, the most inventive, the greatest countries in, in history, the greatest societies, they all started out, at least, with very low levels of taxation, uh, 10, 15, 20 percent of GDP, these kinds of things. Hong Kong, the great economic success story of the second half of the 20th century, taxation as a percentage proportion of GDP never exceeded 14 percent. And it was only the very rich who paid income tax. Any uh, um, anyone below the super rich in Hong Kong, their labor was theirs to keep. They owned their own labor. They, the tax system was based more around taxing land, taxing the value of land than it was labor. And that's a very different society that you create. Right, right. Um, and the incentive you know, structure is completely different. Totally, because if you have a land value tax, for example, the I, and you want, you know, I want to occupy... The, the idea of a land value tax, the philosophy of it is that um, m man didn't make the land. Mother Nature created the land or God created the land, whoever the the super, super whatever being is. Um, and if and man built what's on the land, but the land in its unimproved state should belong to everyone. And if you want exclusive rights to a plot of land, then. Uh, and you want the government to protect your title to that land, then you need to pay a fee to the community for that exclusive right. Mm -hmm. And that fee would be a, a portion, you know, five or 10% of his annual rental value or something like that. And that's a tax based around use, but what you consume, what right. you use, right. Right. rather than how productive you are. Right. And it just totally changes the way the gearing of society. If, if, I think if people could keep all of the proceeds of their own labor, then they'd probably be more productive because there's a bigger incentive to be productive. Um, the tithe, like, even though income tax was only really a 20th, maybe it, the, the first income taxes were probably in the Napoleonic War around about then, beginning of the 19th century. But this idea of the tithe, where you give a tenth of what you earn uh, to the church, goes it predates christianity it goes all the way back to ancient mesopotamia the first civilization but it wouldn't have been paid in money it would have been paid in your time in your produce um you know you give a share of your whatever you farm you you give to your local lord who would often be you know king god lord church they were all there was they were much um more intermingled back then than, than they are now right. less differentiated but there have been societies in history where taxation was voluntary hmm. and again 
you know, we have forced taxation. Uh, 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 you have this amount. It's often deducted before you even receive it if you're working for somebody else. You never actually get the money you earned and hand it over. It's taken at source and it's forced from you. Nobody says thank you. You don't have any uh, relationship. Like if you could see my taxes went to pay for the road that's outside my house. So if you actually paid the, um, you know, the man who makes the road to, to, to build that road outside your house so, and you could actually monitor him building that road and make sure he builds it to a high, sta- high enough standard so you get your value for money. It creates it again. It creates a very different incentive structure. That whole accountability is gone. And it, it happens more when taxes are collected at the local level. But when co- taxes are collected at the federal level by some decentralized body, you know, in I don't even know where the IRS is. It's in some ridiculous part of America, you know. But w- where is the IRS? <laughs> it's everywhere oh. and nowhere. But the the uh, the when there's no accountability, the it's I think it's very important in the process of giving to to. To, to, to get some gratitude. It really is. Otherwise, where's the incentive? And so if taxes were voluntary, or you could actually say, I want to pay a bit of extra tax today, but I want that extra tax to go to building this road in my street. And in exchange for this extra tax going on my street, I want a little plaque. You know, it's only going to cost you a fiver to put the plaque up that says Dominic Frisbee paid this tax for this road in this street. Thank you very much, Dominic Frisbee. And if you had that, those kind of incentives, I think a lot of the time, the, the, the evidence of history in societies where taxes were voluntary and you could actually see the, you know, you were responsible for carrying out the work done or overlooking it. The evidence is people paid more than they were obliged to. And it created mm-hmm. a greater loyalty to the society. Whereas with forced taxation that we have now, the onus is on paying as little as you can legally can. So the incentives are all wrong. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. When I first started my YouTube channel, I, I right from the beginning, I had a payroll of about 5,000 US per month because I had all these editors and everything. And even though the videos were getting like 50 views, I still had this, this big payroll. So after about three or four months, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out a way to somehow monetize to at least cover payroll. So I just, after, you know, once every maybe two weeks at the end of the video, I'd say, hey, if you guys want to donate to the, the our PayPal account, that goes to pay for the, the payroll, the expenses for running this YouTube channel. And because back then with so little views, uh, you don't get much from the, the YouTube advertising thing. And I was shocked at how much people would donate. I mean, people would donate like three, four hundred dollars, five hundred. I'd have people that would donate a thousand dollars at a time just to support the YouTube channel. And it kind of goes back to what you're saying. Uh, another story I remember people hearing. People are nice, George. People yeah, and, are inherently and they, nice. And Charity they are willing to pay for value. Yeah, it's a, exactly. And it, the, the charitable, the process of gi- giving is as important as receiving. And the way we tax people at the moment, it's kind of killed the giving process. Yeah, and I think also, too, the more you centralize the taxation and, and therefore the more you centralize government, when those dollars or euros or British pounds go to the government, so much of it gets wasted before it gets back into the community where it was originally extracted. I mean, I don't know the specific numbers, but I would be willing to guess that if the United States collects, let's say, $3 trillion in tax revenue, a a trillion of that is wasted uh, just before it gets back out into the real economy through uh, corporatism, cronyism, and uh, the Cantillon effect. Yeah, and just basic waste. Just, I bet, you know... uh, spent on stupid ventures unnecessary bureaucracy all of that i mean i i wish you could audit it there have been there was a guy there's a thing in the uk called the taxpayers alliance which audits government waste and they wrote a book called the bumper book of government waste which is hilarious mm. but um but it's also i mean it's hilarious but it's also frustrating because there's so much <laughs> wasted money and the the bottom line is you spend your money better than anyone 
right, you earned right, it. Right. And if you want to waste it, fine. But you will spend it better than someone else will. So what do you think an ideal system looks like? I mean, have you thought about the numbers? Like, would we have a, let's say, a 10% sales tax and a, a 0% income tax? So it incentivizes people to be more prudent, uh, people to save their money, people to work harder, but yet to consume less, to produce more than they consume? Well, um, there's like the final chapter of this of this book is I call it designing utopia. Mm. And I recognize that my utopia is not necessarily politically politically practicable. Right. Uh, but nevertheless, I you know, it's a book so I can design utopia. And I would. Um, I do think some kind of tax is inevitable. But in my ideal world, the government would be doing a lot less. The government wouldn't be responsible for educating, wouldn't be responsible for health care. I just think the free market will provide those things to a much higher standard at a much lower cost than government ever can. Um, but somebody's got to pay for an army. I guess you need a police. You know, somebody's got to defend the borders. Um, so, you know, let's just assume that some kind of tax whether it's to a private landlord or a or a or a government, some kind of tax is inevitable. I would. I'm sorry, I keep rubbing my nose. I've got this terrible cold. Oh, um, don't worry about it. I would. I would make it much more based around land, land use. Uh, so property taxes. Well, I, I call it. I actually call it location usage tax. Is how I describe it. How, how does um, how does that differ from a property tax? Because. The a property tax is based on not just the land, but what's on the land. So if you if you had two uh, plots of land next to each other in the States and one had a beautiful house on it and one just was scrubland, but they were right next to each other and they were the same size, the one with the beautiful house on it would pay a much higher level of tax than the scrubland. Yeah. 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 My point is that they should but the two should pay the same amount of tax. OK. Because the beautiful house is is a result of human endeavor. And that should be yours to keep. It's only what nature gave you that should be shared, that is mm. communally owned. Okay. So you, it, you would have what's called an unimproved value. You have to assess the unimproved value of the land and the tax is based on the land and its unimproved value. And so, for example, let's say, uh, you know, you live in a house in a, in a town and then the town taxes uh, as a result of taxes paid by all the people in the town they build a station beautiful station with a fast link right into the middle of new york city and so everyone within who's got a house within a 10 minute walk of that station their house doubles in value well that has got nothing to do with your endeavor that is because the the needs of the taxpayer and the needs of the town built that station and the value of your land has gone up. It's not because of the value of your house that's gone up. It's the value of your land that's gone up. And so th th that in that case, that person would pay a slightly higher tax. Okay. Because it's the needs of the community that have pushed up the value of that person's land. Anyway, I'd have so it's it's Henry George was the big American philosopher who was the big proponent of this. And the game Monopoly was devised to show the in the inequities, the inequities of um the land system in its current shape <laughs> mm. the way land currently works so i'd have tax based on that i'd have much i'd have income tax at 10 or 15 percent sales tax at 10 or Just 15 percent yeah oh flat yeah you know mm. above i don't know starting at twenty thousand dollars below twenty thousand dollars is free okay and but i would try and introduce and this isn't actually in the book it's only something that's occurred to me afterwards little incentives to encourage people to pay more if they can, for example, hypothecate where that tax goes. So if hmm. they want to pay more to the health service or they want to pay more to this or whatever, then they can. And But they can say, I want it to be spent specifically on this. Hmm. And I would try and introduce a reward system whereby, you know, you get your little plaque that says that you help make this thing happen. Because people need rewards. It's why social media works so well, because you get your likes on Twitter and everyone's like, oh, I've got a like, you right. know. 
you get your little dopamine fix. We'll introduce that into the tax system and, and, and you know, give people rewards and actually thank them. You know, if the president got up in the morning and as part of his speech that day, he said, look, I want to thank George Gammon because he made this donation. It's like the president. He said, thank you. Hmm. It's go, everyone's going to want the president to say thank you to them. Do you see what I mean? You, and yeah. it doesn't have to be the president. But so all these little incentives can be brought in to encourage people to pay more. But it would be voluntary, wouldn't be coerced. Much better society. Hmm. That, yeah, that's really uh, an interesting. But, you know, in the free market, to your point with social media, they kind of gamify and, and they use human psychology to incentivize people to take action and spend a longer time on the platform. I mean, pretty much everything. Pretty yeah, much it's sort of coercive. It's psychologically coercive. You don't realize you're being coerced, but you, you know, <laughs> yeah. that you are. You yeah. are. So if, if we have a, a better system that has a better incentive structure, in my mind, it still goes back to the government being incredibly wasteful. And even if they're getting, let, let's say, um, let's say they're getting half as much as they are today and they're getting them from different sources. But still, they're, if they're getting half, let's say they're getting $3 trillion now, they get $1.5 trillion. So they would have to reduce government to a, a smaller size. But there's still that waste component of it, where $500 billion of it is going to the political insiders, uh, you know, using it for war or what have you. How, how do you, or is there a solution for that? Well, the, you find with land value tax, you find a much big closer relationship between government the, i mean the other you know the other thing you do in an ideal world is you have a sound money system that governments can't print because that's oh, straight go. away that forces a discipline on so you yeah you'd want both you know, oh, 100 percent. Right, right, right. and the land value tax brings far greater accountability because if government's spending too much they're gonna they've got to raise your land value tax and then everyone's like no i'm not doing that mm. and so so it keeps it keeps them in check it's quite a good healthy and then they can't print the money no to, to get around because and it needs to be stipulated it needs to be governments have got to stop. I don't quite know how you stop it, but I think you force them economically to like basically the way democracy works at the moment is the, the government that promises the most goodies gets elected. Yeah. And then they right. and then they take on obligations and, and then spending goes up. So, you know, it needs to be clearly, you know, for example, if the government is going to provide health care, I don't I personally, I think the free market can do it perfectly well. But let's say the government provides health care. And by the way, in America, you don't even have government provided health care and your government still spends more per capita on health care than than systems where you do have state health care. So I just I still struggle to get my obesity. head around the American. It's obesity. Yeah. People really they I don't know why, especially here in the States, they can't connect those dots. If you just leave the United States for six months and then come back, you'll immediately know why we spend so much on health care because everyone weighs 400 pounds. Yeah. That's a whole nother subject. And I've read a very good book about that called Why We Eat Too Much. I've literally just put it down last night. And it's uh, a new way of looking at obesity. And it's very interesting. But but let's not go down that route because it's yeah. not my specialist <laughs> subject. Uh, <laughs> I just but pick it out. Um, <clears throat> it's all to do with genetic metabolisms. And, and, and it's quite interesting. Anyway, so... Um, but, uh, you, you know, for example, you can get here in the UK Viagra on the NHS, on the National Health Service. Now, is that and you can get like weird gender. What do you call it when you change gender surgery? Those oh, kind uh, of gen. Yeah. Now, now, personally, you know, if somebody wants to change their gender or whatever, that's totally up to them as far as I'm concerned. But I don't feel I should pay for it. Right, right, yeah. And I don't feel that's essential. And, you know, when the government's providing this healthcare, loads of people come along and abuse it and get stuff out of it. So I think there just needs to be a bare minimum that is provided. You know, you've got a, a room in a hospital, in a dormitory, and if you want your own war room, then you pay a little bit extra. You can have your own room, you have to pay a little extra. So it needs to be, you know, there needs to be a, a minimum service that is clearly stipulated what the government is going to provide, and anything on top of that, the cost the consumer pays. And so I think we need a bit more discipline in that in that department. Um, but you know, like, why do we need schools, for example, in their current form, and all the money that gets spent on schools when you know the internet 
is like the most fantastic learning tool ever created in human history and it's free right you yeah. know and 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 technology is coming to the, to healthcare as well so i th and and you know in london why do we need tubes and buses anymore when uber uh, is doing it like i can get a journey with uber across central london it's cheaper than getting a tube now so why mm -hmm. do we need the tubes and all the money that gets spent on the tubes? And when we when we cars go driverless, it's going to get even cheaper. So technology is providing all the things that government used to provide or is now providing to a higher standard at a lower cost. And so te technology is make, going to make a lot of government services just look redundant. And 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 I think we're going into a world where tech is our new ruler. Like already the combined market cap of say apple amazon microsoft google is bigger than the gdp of every country in the world except china and the usa so technology is extraordinarily powerful and the tech giants are probably as powerful as as um uh governments and if they needed to you know if the tech company needs an army it could probably got enough money to pay for it if it wanted but it's but because tech companies aren't in one place they're sort of globalized and digital we don't realize but we're going into and so laws and justice and rules are going to be made by they already are being made by the tech companies rather than um the government a lot of the time there'll be an alliance between the two so for example already what Twitter decides is free speech or acceptable speech or Facebook is very different from what, you know, the government says is free speech in every given country. You know, Twitter, no, it's Twitter has decides what is acceptable speech and what isn't. Yeah, but it's based uh, on the, the prevailing political narrative. It is, and, and, but, and but what the, the free speech the, rate, it differs from country to country. What is accepted and what isn't. And Twitter has its own rules. And yet it is based on the prevailing narrative, but Twitter still it has, I, I, you know, and when we have, for example, driverless cars, you will not be able to speed because it will be programmed into the car that it doesn't speed. You will not be able to, uh, you know, not put your seatbelt on because the car won't drive away unless you have your seatbelt in. So the 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 rules of the platform will often reflect the rules of the country but often platforms will gradually set their own rules and their own laws and you know th these will be determined by computer coders rather than democracy dominic, dominic let me tell you one thing if george gammon ever buys a car it will live by my rules <laughs> <laughs> it will not force you to wear a seat belt i don't care if it doesn't drive itself i don't care if i have to drive it but it will live by my rules i will not own a car <laughs> you, you're, you're like <laughs> uh, will smith in i robot if you've ever seen that film i just well that takes us down a, a completely separate path so well if these tech giants are now kind of making the rules doesn't that put us on another slippery slope? And I'm someone that believes yeah. that a private company should have the right to do whatever they want. But but where it gets a little murky is the system we have right now isn't really a free market because the, these tech giants have been able to create monopoly with the help of government. And um, I think that if you just got government regulation out of the way that we would get a lot of competing uh, entities and at the end of the day, if, if you don't have to use Facebook, I don't know that it really destroys your, your life to that great of a, a degree. But, um, you know, I think it's this crony capitalism that we have right now that really limits the uh, healthy competition and therefore puts this moat of isolation around these kind of, let's call them tech monopolies. So if they're the ones that control everything, I mean, aren't we on the same slippery slope that we are with big governments controlling our lives yeah and the the tithe the tax you pay to the tech company will be your data yeah right exactly <laughs> but see yeah, then that are, data goes the to the government slope. because they're yeah, in I, bed with the government yeah i agree there's an unholy alliance going on between the two that suits them both um you know google does 
a lot of the police's work for it, for example, reporting like, gee, if it gets a hint that, you know, you're involved in child pornography or something from by reading your emails, then it will report you to the police. You know, so there is a, there is we don't know, but we do know that that kind of stuff's going on. Um, so there is there is they are working together. And yeah. Dominic, like, do you guys have DMV or the equivalent in uh, the UK? That's just the local little government office where you go down and get your driver's license and they give you the title to your car. And uh, I'm sure you guys have an equivalent there, but it's not called. Well, DMV. we have that would be that would be the DVLA, the driving vehicle licenses i don't know what it stands for but that's actually a an office they've got an office in uh, swansea in wales so everything but but we do have local councils and well i was going to tell you local... i was going to tell you a story so in the states we've got something called dmv yeah and uh i had a car registered in arizona a few months back and th i didn't even realize it at the time but when i went to get the registration they didn't give me the paper title to the car, which you'd normally have and give to the buyer, uh, yeah. bless you, if you were to, you. to sell the car, um, just like, you know, you always get for the last, uh, you know, 30 years that I've been buying and selling cars. So anyway, I went to sell the car. Where's the title? Don't know. Oh, it's paperless title. So then I'm like, okay, well, how do I get the physical piece of paper to give to the guy that's buying the car? And I had to go and create an online profile with the DMV and I'm like, okay, I already don't like this, but it is what it is. Right. So then they keep going and now I've got to verify my email address. Now I've got to verify through 15 text messages. Then I get to another portal where they say, okay, you've done all this verification, but now we'd like to verify you through you downloading our app and then using facial recognition. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what is going on here? And then through that last email that they sent me through the verification process, I like, keep in mind, this is just a transaction between myself and DMV. But I look at who the last email came from to verify my account, and it came from Microsoft. So now all go. of a sudden, you've got Microsoft that's running the back end of the Arizona DMV that is requiring you to access your title, to access your driver's license, to access your driving record in the future, to use uh, facial recognition. And then all of that is being stored by our benevolent custodians over at Microsoft. Yeah, and Microsoft and, and, aren't doing it for the USA. They're doing it for everyone, I imagine. Yeah, and this is going back to your unholy uh, trinity. This is what I'm... Uh, you know, a little concerned with. I, I, I wish we had a separation of church and state there. Yeah, well, I agree. And it's the nature of technology. But I, I bet you Microsoft are doing it for several countries in South America and several countries in Europe as well. And what are they doing with all that information? You know, they, they can say we're not using it for anything, but it's you can bet your bottom dollar it's being monitored and stored. Yeah. And also, too, let's think about they're probably doing the the, uh, the, the cameras for uh, the grocery store. So when you walk into the grocery store or maybe the cameras on the street corners, I'm sure you guys have a lot of those in the UK where they're, you know, they're, they're taking pictures of you in video as you're walking down the street or driving your car, that's using the facial recognition that they're matching up and requiring you to check in maybe once a month. And they're putting all of this together. Uh, I think where it goes inevitably is kind of a, a, a social score that will trump for lack of a better word, your your actual credit score when you go to get a loan or something. 100%. Um, tech is going to be everywhere in our lives. You're going to have little molars. Uh, 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 you're going to have little bits of tech in your mouth. Um, you, you're going to have like sensors in your hand that you can, you know, with a chip that you can get on the bus. There'll be sensors in your clothes that monitor your heat. They'll give you little rewards if you wear your these clothes in a certain, you know, social situation where you're being photographed. You think of Alexa, your phone. What was it the other day? There was one the other day. I forget what it was, but I'll do the one that happened the week before. Um, I was... Uh, uh, I, I needed to get my ears cleaned out. I had, I had blocked ears and mm. I phoned up 
I phoned up the um, I'd literally got my phone out and texted the uh, a Googled ear clinic near me and phoned up an ear clinic. And then I open my phone and the next thing I know, Facebook's marketing uh, ear suction clinics at me. Right, like, right, right. Well, within five minutes. Oh, I know what it was. I was I was doing a podcast with a guy who is a prosthetics expert, and mm. he started telling me how he was inspired. Not a yeah, make prosthetic arms and that kind of thing. Yeah. And he started telling me how he was inspired um, to make prosthetic arms because he was a massive fan of Iron Man when he was a kid, the comic character Iron Man. Mm. And I always quite liked Iron Man, but I'd literally not mentioned Iron Man for maybe ten years. And then I get back home, I go on my computer, I go to look on a website, I'm reading some blog or something, and it's advertising Iron Man uh, uh, little <laughs> Iron Man figurines at me. So yeah. my phone was listening to me, and my phone was off. You know, not off, uh, you know, on, what do they call it, airplane mode. Right, right. So, you know, we are being listened to and monitored everywhere, and you can rest assured that your inappropriate speech will be monitored as well. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, and for sure, when we go to central bank digital currencies, yeah. uh, your social capital will matter as much as your like before they would have to look at how credit worthy is this guy? Do You're we right. lend him money or not? Right. Now it's going to be how good is this guy? Mm hmm. Exactly. Yeah, does he say the right things? Okay, we'll give him a more favourable interest rate. Or oh, do you know what? We'll give him a more generous loan because he said the right things and he supports the the uh, the administration. You know, for sure, that's where we're going. I've come to the exact same conclusions, and it's just I want everyone to realize that I'm not talking in certainties. I'm only talking in probabilities. We could go a completely different direction. Hopefully, we will. But what? led you to draw those conclusions um well i've been doing a bit of work on central bank digital currencies i've written a few articles about them okay. and and again i've just written you know i've got this one of the chapters in this book is called tech our new rulers and it makes the point of just how tech is going to be like there are now smart vibrators okay do you know, what, like a woman's and and you can a man can buy an oral sex simulator <laughs> that has machine learning embedded into it so that it learns the machine learns what you like from your oral sex simulator and gets better. OK, this is wow. tech in the most <laughs> intimate areas of our lives. Do you know what I'm talking? And it's going to be, it's going to, there'll be some kind of sensor in the bathroom when you're having a shower. So it's just so per pervasive and it will be, un and all the time data will be extracted and used and, and monitored and reused. And we have very little control over, you, you know, your spending habits. There's loads of, it's really easy, like to make, like, for example, if you buy fresh fennel, that means you are a low insurance risk. Yeah, right. Like they've made the contact and they found that they've studied this, that and the other. And they found that people who buy fresh fennel are low insurance risk. Or another one like that was like. I think organic in, food is like the same way too. Well, I know it's specifically fresh fennel. And another one is if, um, and Trump, Trump did this in the 2016 election that he won. They discovered that people who owned American cars were more likely to vote for Donald Trump and people who own foreign cars were more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton. Mm. So they, they got, they then targeted, they found everyone who owned American cars in the swing states, in the key, you know, the states that determine it. They found all the ones who hadn't voted for in the last few elections or were swing voters who owned American cars and specifically targeted them. And so you're seeing there how data, an innocent thing like what national, what make of car you have, can say all sorts of things about you that you had no idea. I think Facebook can ask you five questions. And after asking you those five questions, it's able to predict your answers to other stuff more effectively than your spouse. Mm. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, so it's so clever, machine learning. And it's just it's just and so that is one, one trend that's going on. Yeah, and right. then you see great attack you know covid you see there's this been this huge power grab with covid from governments trying to control your movement control your spending furlough money ubi all these you know higher taxes you know, every 
I say every dollar that the government prints is a, a dollar further expanded into the economy, a, a dollar further of government intervention in the economy. Yeah, that's right. It, 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 government reach increases with every dollar it prints. Yeah, it's a, and so it's government spending is a higher percentage of GDP with every dollar. Yeah. No, but I mean, actual government state reach into our lives increases with every pound they print. And so the you put all these dynamics together, you look at what is possible with central bank digital currencies, programmable money. Yeah, right. Like at least with cash, you can decide when you spend it and what you spend it on. And if you want to go and spend it on, you know, weed from a drug dealer on the corner, you can. If you want to screw it up in a ball and whatever, you can. With programmable money, you don't have, it's more convenient, but you don't have anything like as much control. If the government says, no, I don't, you can't spend it on this, or you can't spend it on this certain retailer, or I'll tell you what they can do, expiry dates. They, right. You know, if you thought if you thought inflation was eating away at the value of your money, wait right. till you get expiry dates. Oh no, we got a crisis. We need we don't want people saving. We need people to spend money for the national good. Expiry dates. Mm. You know, all this stuff is possible, and it's going to give that group of people, behavioural economists, um, they're going to have a field day. You know, yeah. it just opens the door. Like people always use, or or tax has always been used as a means to control and guide behaviour. Uh, that's always like, for example, a famous example, beard taxes. Peter the Great in Russia decided that Russian, he wanted Russia to be more like Western Europe and he, beards were unfashionable. Never mind that it's freezing cold and people wear beards for a very sensible, practical reason. No, beards are unfashionable. I don't want people to have beards. So he imposed a beard tax. And if you hadn't, you had to, if you, you had to hang a token from your beard that said the beard is, is a superfluous bur burden on one stage and then on the other it said tax paid and if you didn't hang this token from your beard you could be forcibly shaven <laughs> <laughs> in public so that's an example of you know or you see it now sugar taxes or taxes on fuel you know oh it's for the green it's for the environment no it's not it's for your revenue but th they they use it to guide and manipulate behavior and you know, we have a thing in the UK called the Ministry of Nudges, and I bet you've got something similar in the States. It doesn't officially, it's unofficially known as the Ministry of Nudges. But, you know, if they want to manipulate and control your behaviour, central bank digital currencies make that so much more possible. And that's where we're going. Fortunately, thank the Lord, we've got cryptocurrencies. Um, and they will sort of keep it in check. Because if you've got expiry dates, oh, well, I'll just keep Bitcoin. There's no expiry dates on Bitcoin. Right. And so I do think, and they will normalize the use of wallets. So people get used to using wallets because they have their central bank digital currency wallet. So it, they'll almost be like an on-ramp into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness, because that's the only thing that, that will keep it in check. Yeah. The All free right. market providing a better alternative. Yeah, we, we've got a, that's it. That That's, that's the solution. It. Is, is the free market. We've just got to hope that it's still allowed to, to work and flourish in the future. I guess that's kind of the, the unknown. But uh, Dominic, it's been a, a fantastic conversation. I feel sorry for you, buddy, with your cold the whole time. But man, you were really bringing some, some value bombs. That was a yeah. fascinating conversation. So I really appreciate you hanging in there and spending an hour with me. For my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do or to check out your new book, where can they go? Yeah, um, thank you very much, George. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I follow you on uh, Twitter, and you're a good guy. I admire your work, and, uh, <laughs> you know, let's keep up the good fight. My son's just come back from university. He's 20 years old, and he's come back from university with a stinking cold, and and thank he's very kindly, you know, you're given it to you. me, so I'm very grateful <laughs> for that. But, um, yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I've got lots of comic videos, funny songs that you can watch on my YouTube channel. I've got two YouTube channels. I've got one with, like, serious stuff talking about markets, and then I've got one what, that's called Dominic Frisbee Money and Markets and the other one's called Dominic Frisbee Comedy Videos and that's all my silly songs but we were here to talk about this book Daylight Robbery which yeah. is now available in the States you can buy it at Amazon or all good bookshops or you can have the audio book read by me with my beautiful voice and uh, so please buy that and, and enjoy it is it on Amazon did you just say that yeah it should be it should be it didn't get an official like publishing's really weird it's published by Penguin Random House in the UK mm -hmm. And so it's published, uh, sorry, Penguin Business in the UK. And so it's published by Penguin Business in the States, but it didn't get like a an official thing. So it's it's available, but there wasn't like a huge push because 
like an American distributor didn't come and buy it. So I'm trying to prove to Penguin Random House that I, there's a huge audience for me in the States uh, for libertarian anti-tax material. <laughs> yeah. I think there is quite a big audience for that. Oh, so yeah, the more there people, is. the more yeah. people that buy it, the more Penguin Random House will get the message and, and sort out a proper distribution next time. Okay, well, I think everyone should go and check it out and buy it. If you've got a link, Dominic, we'll go ahead and put it in the description of this video so people can oh, just okay, go directly sure. there and uh, and purchase it. So, okay. And thanks for your time, buddy. I can't wait to do it again. Thank you, George. Take care.